Well, my talk today is uh, the second half of a talk on the paramitas. And I will explain what they are in a second. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to, there are six paramitas, so we covered the first three last time. So we're going to talk about the second three, and I'll introduce it. And then with each one, we're doing a kind of, it's, it's called lojong. And the word lojong from Tibetan means mind training. So this part of the lojong is called slogan practice. And so these slogans, which I gave everybody a copy of, have something to do with each of the paramitas. So we will practice that um, as a form of meditation for five minutes after each one. So that's kind of how we're going to do it. And Oh, let's see. <laughs> you can. Um, so I'll talk about the fourth, fifth, and sixth paramitas. And if anybody has any questions after I finish talking about each one, feel free to ask, since this might be brand new to some people. Um, so to review what the paramitas are, there are... In Buddhism, the word yana <coughs> means path. So there are actually nine yanas or nine paths. But there are three big paths. The first one is called the Hinayana, then the Mahayana, and the Vajrayana. So we are talking about the middle path, the Mahayana. And that's what the Paramitas are all about. So that is called the path of the Bodhisattva the middle path. And what you're learning on the path, well, let me, let me start with the first, first path, the Hinayana. What you're learning on the Hinayana path, the sort of final goal, is peaceful abiding within your mind. So that's, that's what the word meditation means, is peaceful abiding. So your practice on that part of the path leads you to that. So now we're on the second path, the path of the Bodhisattva. And the idea is that, or it's, it's actually the third path. So the idea is that you've worked with yourself to a certain point and you desire to work with yourself further. And the path of the Bodhisattva is how to become friends with yourself, how to take care of yourself, and how to extend compassion and care to other sentient beings. So that's what this path is. The, and the, the way to practice this path is through the six paramitas. And the paramitas are, um, the word paramita means gone completely beyond. So it means it's a path that enables you to go beyond samsara, which is uh, characterized by continuous suffering. So it's a path that helps you to go completely beyond that. So the, it's, it's actually presented as a path, and the paramitas are the six qualities that you put effort into developing within yourself that help you to move along that path. Um, so I have a summary of the six paramitas, and this is by a teacher called Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. He's the one who founded the Shambhala Center. And this is from one of his fabulous books. These are uh, transcripts of talks that he gave. Um, so here's what he says about the paramitas. Uh, and he lists all six, and this, I've actually listed the six on that sheet if you want to follow them. The paramita of generosity, dana paramita, is described as a treasury of wealth, the absence of poverty. The paramita of discipline is described as a perfume which permeates good discipline overall, free from passion. The paramita of patience, kashanti paramita, that, that is wrong. It's not kashanti. It's, 
oh well, is described as the armor which protects you from aggression. The paramita of exertion, virya paramita, is described as a good horse, which is joyful and free from laziness. The paramita of meditation, dhyana paramita, is described as a good rider. Once you ride on the horse of exertion, you develop complete mindfulness and skillfulness of how to ride. You develop constant steadiness, which is like maintaining a good seat as you ride your horse. The paramita of prajna is described as a sword. The bodhisattva, or would-be bodhisattva, is described as a good rider. In some sense, he's like the, the knight of medieval tradition. He is wealthy with generosity. He wears tremendous perfume so that he feels good. Then he puts on his suit of armor. He has a horse and he rides on it. He has his weapons around him, his swords and so forth. The idea is to become a really good warrior. That seems to be the basic point of the six paramitas. Any questions before we go on to the individual paramitas? All right, so the fourth paramita is called the perfection of joyous effort and enthusiastic perseverance. And the Sanskrit name is virya. So that's the same root word as viral. Just like generosity is the, the same root word of generate. So there's the idea of being able to create something, you know, having the power to create something new in yourself and in your life. So joyous effort, so this is, on, this is um, all of these qualities are because you're on the bodhisattva path. So there, all of these are work just in the world as we experience it, but they are especially in the, in the way that they're explained because we're on the bodhisattva path. So the perseverance here is the idea of not giving up, of being delighted in the practice. Um, and exertion means lack of laziness. So laziness is a lack of mindfulness and a lack of joy in discipline. So you're developing joy and appreciation for what you're doing on the path. And a, a way to uh, say that is that your mind is mixing with the Dharma. So your mind is becoming very slowly, gradually transformed by your study and your practices. Exertion also involves a sense of pushing yourself. You're connecting to the path, but as you connect to the path, you also encounter resistance. So exertion is the quality that helps you to overcome that resistance and push through it because you, also, you always have to bring your mind back to the idea that it's joyous effort. So it's not a slog along this path, but you just remind yourself of, of what's joyous about it. The resistance can be overcome by overcoming laziness by ceasing to dwell in the entertainment of your discursive thoughts and emotionalism. So effort within the mind delights in virtue. We practice effort when we enthusiastically apply ourselves to Dharma study or practice, strive to accomplish Dharma realizations or put effort into helping others. To generate effort, we overcome three types of laziness. And the three types of laziness are, the first one is procrastination. So that is the unwillingness or the hesitation to even begin to practice immediately. That's the word in the teachings, immediately. So when you hear about these practices, if it's going to make any difference to you, you have to start immediately. You can't think that there's going to be a better time to practice or when you finish this project, then you'll get serious about your practice. You have to do it right now. And procrastination comes up constantly. Uh, the next one is attraction to what is meaningless or non-virtuous. So it's our um, 
lazy way of doing things that are meaningless, like, you know, being tired at night and watching television when there's, or whatever it is, whatever your line of least resistance when you don't feel like putting forth effort is. Um, and the third one is discouragement. So discouragement is the attitude in your mind that you have something to accomplish and you're not really getting very far on the path. So the first thing is to drop that attitude that there's something to accomplish and just go back to where you are. There's really nothing to accomplish. You are where you are and you're just simply doing your practice. Um, and what happens when people become discouraged, then they begin to not only find fault in their selves, but in other people. It's like saying, well, this Buddhism is harder than I thought it was going to be. Or I don't really get it. I'm not having the results I wanted. And it's because, you know, my teacher is not really the right teacher for me. And the other people I'm studying with are irritating to me, that kind of thing. So you, it sort of extends and extends. Um, so you just have to bring yourself back to why you were doing this in the first place. Uh, there's some skillful means for developing effort. Um, one is that it is uh, not recommended to, when you first hear about a practice, to think, yeah, I'm going to do that, and then do it with a lot of um, enthusiasm and effort right at the beginning, and then your effort dries up. So you have to, like, to be skillful, you have to figure out how you can actually do these practices and where they fit in your life. Um, and I think that's really important to, like, if you decide that you want to meditate every day, to figure out the time in your day when it's going to work for you and then to actually do it at that time. And not, so I meditate first thing when I get up and I get up at five o'clock and I've done that for years and it's an easy time for me to do it because it's before my day actually has to begin or it's the way I begin my day. But other people I know practice in the evening. Um, Uh, when this is something that Kempo has told us many times, and that when you are actually doing meditation, and you notice your so you're following your breath, and you notice that your mind has gotten tired, then it's time. Then take a break right then. So, and when you're meditating, you can take a break by stopping observing your breath and sort of observe the. Um, Vast, the spaciousness of your mind. And then when your thoughts begin to wander, you go right back to your breath. So the same applies with your other practices, whatever practice you're doing. If you're tired of it, then stop. So that's something else that Kempo says, to, to like always stop at a point where you're still enjoying it. So if it gets to feel like, like it's too hard, it's drudgery, then to stop at that point and pick it up when you're properly rested and you want to, and you have enthusiasm for it. So you build enthusiasm by starting with enthusiasm and ending with enthusiasm. So that is the fourth paramita, joyous effort. Any questions about that part? All right, then R. So the way this meditation works, this is actually called Vipassana meditation. So, and has everybody practiced meditation? So what we're going to do, and we'll do this for about five minutes, is when you're doing shamatha meditation, you're focusing on your breath. So what you're going to focus on here, instead of the breath, is this saying, this lojang saying. And the one that goes with the perfection of joyous effort is, you see that it's the fourth one down, continuously apply only a joyful mind. 
So that is that slogan is the object of your meditation. So when so what you're doing is you're keeping your mind completely on that slogan, on, on what the words mean, what the whole thing means, what it means to you. When you, when you start, th when your mind gets discursive or you start thinking about other things, then you bring your mind back to focusing on the slogan. And I, it's written here so that you can stop what you're doing and read it again if you need to. Got it? So it's different than just repeating it over and over like a mantra. You want more like investigation kind of thing? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, you know, there's not really any rule. So if repeating it over and over feels like the thing to do, then that's what, then do that. Or if, um, because these are, I mean, these, this is, I, I forgot to put this on the bottom of this sheet, but this is by, this is a book called The Seven Stages, it's from a book called The Seven Stages of Mind Training by Atisha. So this came from India originally. This is an, an ancient set of practices. And they, the, the, um, the translation that I'm using here came from Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche's translation group. And so these seem like they're pretty, um, it's like poetry, they're a little bit dense. So it's, it's, there's a lot there, you know, it's not, it's, there's, a, there's a lot there to um, inform your mind. So you could, I mean, like for instance, the word continuously, continuously, what does that mean? From lifetime to lifetime? You know, that's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a good word. Also, apply, <laughs> another great word, only. Another word, a joyful mind. So there's really a lot that, to meditate on. A lot to, like, you're, you're another way of um, describing meditation is becoming accustomed to. So in a way, you're, you're letting your mind become accustomed to the vast teachings of the Mahayana here. And the idea is that you would memorize these. There's about 87 of these slogans and you would memorize them. That's part of the practice of being a bodhisattva so that you always have them in your mind when the occasion arises, when you need them. All right, so I'm gonna start it with the gong and we'll do it for five minutes. Ready? Okay, so the, perf the next one is the perfection of concentration. And the Sanskrit word is dhyana, and the Tibetan, Tibetan word is samten. Sam means thought process, and ten means stabilized. So concentration is a stabilized thought process. And concentration is two things. It's removing your attention off distractions, removing your attention from distractions, and placing your attention on the object of focus. And that's always true when you concentrate. You always have to remove your attention from distractions and place it. Remember what Steve said that Kempo had told him your attention is like a cup. So you take it and you place it where you want it to be. So, what, through concentration, you can watch what goes on in your mind as a river flowing or a mountain range. There's a sense of being aware of everything that is taking place. Practicing mindfulness and awareness is like protecting yourself from the lethal <coughs> fangs of wild animals. If there were not mindfulness and awareness, we would have no way of protecting ourselves from attacks. And the, the wild animals, the attacks that he's referring to here are called the clashes, so that, and they are actually come from inside ourselves, like our own craziness when it attacks. So, it, so the protection from that is concentration. 
the ability which we practice in doing meditation by being aware of thoughts. We have the ability to hear those thoughts, to see those thoughts as they arise, and then to, to do something about them right on the spot. And so that's what the perfection of concentration is. So this is um, essential to the path of the bodhisattva, is the ability to be able to concentrate. Mental stabilization or concentration is a mind whose nature is single-pointedly placed on a virtuous object and whose function is to prevent distraction. So concentration in our everyday lives, like, you know, when you're at work, you can practice concentration by removing your attention from any distractions and placing it on what you're trying to accomplish at your job. For, for this, on the path of the bodhisattva, the concentration is your mind is single-pointedly placed on a virtuous object. So that's the difference. So this is, this is the, the uh, paramitas mean the, means the perfection of. So the perfection of any quality is how, it's, how you use it in becoming a bodhisattva. So that's, that is the perfection, that you're placing your mind single-pointedly on a virtuous object. So concentration functions by means of our mental consciousness. We have six consciousnesses. The first five have to do with the senses, and the sixth is the mental consciousness or the mind. So concentration is a function of the mind consciousness. So it means being able to focus your mind consciousness and hold it stable. Um, to improve our concentration, it's necessary for our mind to gather within and dwell upon its object single-pointedly. Single we must take as our main object of concentration a generic image that appears to the mental consciousness. Eventually, through the power of concentration, the generic image is worn away and the object is perceived directly. So what that means is if you have a, a generic image of something you want, say, to start with the first paramita, which is generosity. So you're wanting to develop the quality of generosity. So, you, so using concentration to develop that, you hold in your mind the, the generic image or the image of what you think generosity is. You hold it there. Then, through the power of concentration, the image is worn away and the object is perceived directly. So what happens is we start, like if we're starting to develop generosity, we have all kinds of ideas about it. Some of them are accurate, some of them are inaccurate. Some of them will be productive, some of them will not be productive. For instance, the idea that, I mean, we all have the idea that giving, we want something back, or we're, or we're um, identifying the value of what we're giving, or we're expecting this from the person we're giving to. So all of those, so that, that's how we're gonna start with generosity. And then generosity has to do with all of our attachments to various things that are, are clinging to physic, to the world and are clinging to our attitudes. So all of that is what we're trying to give up with developing concentration, for, with developing generosity. So this paramita concentration comes in with holding on to that long enough so that it becomes not just an idea in our minds, but we're actually experiencing generosity in our hearts and in our lives. So it's a long process, but um, an exciting one, I think, that idea of how, of it, how it becomes real. It's, it's no longer just thoughts about it. It's, and the path is practice, and through our practice, we're investigating. So this path is very much about investigation. So we're investigating how these things actually work in our minds. So not, not, not in general in the world, but how they work for us, and how we can cause uh, us ourselves to have a more virtuous, is his word, or you could say more evolved or more um, Buddha-like 
appreciation of the qualities of the Bodhisattva. Um, so in a mind stilled by concentration, delusions subside and the mind becomes increasingly lucid. At the moments, our mind are intractable, refusing to cooperate with our virtuous intentions. But concentration melts the tension in our minds and bodies and makes them supple, comfortable, and easy to work with. It's difficult for a distracted mind to become sufficiently acquainted with its object to induce spontaneous realization because our mind is here and the object is there. So those things, so when we're working on generosity, we, our mind is, it's in our mind and the object is outside of us. But really the end result is when the two are merged. There's no inside and outside, no subject and object. It's all just an expression of our true nature. Only a direct realization of emptiness has the power to cut through the continuum of self-grasping. So emptiness, once again, is another of those objects that we hold in our mind as wanting to realize. And then through our investigation and our practice, we actually experience it. Um, in the course of mastering concentration, we achieve clairvoyance and other miraculous powers to enhance our ability to help others. So this is definitely part of the path. Um, the, and I think this was in Hinduism before Buddhism that there were those amazing powers that people were able to develop. Um, and one of the powers is clairvoyance, which is talked about on the Buddhist path, the idea that you can see into another person's mind or you can see the past and the future. And th th that you would be able to help people more by having that information. And then another of the powers is the ability to travel to a specific place without your body. And um, it, last week Anne said that the teachings of the third wheel happened in, not in a physical realm, but an inner realm. So these teachings go on in the inner realms of our minds, for instance, sometimes people have dreams about the Buddha or dreams about their teachers. And those dreams are your mind going to a place, uh, you know, it's an actual place, it's not a physical place, but it, it's an actual event of your mind that did happen. And the more you develop your concentration, the ability to have a concentrated mind the easier it is to believe that that can happen. Any questions about that part? What did you say you get to the other part? Which other part? Of the two judges. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> That's a really good one. So, so there are two, um, you, can, you have your choice of two things to contemplate. Okay, what do you think that means? Are the two judges hold the principal one? No, no. <laughs> I hate to say no, but it does have a specific meaning. <laughs> so the two judges are yourself and other, other people, judgments of other people or judgments of, or how, what you imagine the judgments of the world are. So judges is like judgments. Yeah, yes. Okay. So the two judges hold the principal one. So what do you think the principal one is? Yourself, of yeah. Two, of the two, it's yourself. So it's a, and that's really essential to this path, to like begin to trust your own judgments, to trust your own mind, because that's what it's all about. I mean, that's where everything happens within your mind. So you have to trust that what you're doing is the right thing, that you that your path has taken you to where you need to be, that your way of judging an experience is the best way for you because nobody else knows what you've been through. It's like developing that confidence in yourself. 
that you're the one who generates the things that happen in your life. And then the other one you could, so, so pick one of the two to contemplate on, is that's a little bit more straightforward. You're well-trained when you can practice even when distracted. Sounds like a poor translation. They all, they all sound like poor translations <laughs> to me, but I um, would not retranslate them. I mean, I feel like people, very learned people did this translation. Um, so, you pick one of those two and we'll contemplate that for five minutes. I yes? I don't see how the first one about contemplation of the two judges has a simple thing. That's a really good question. Um, any thoughts on that? Do you, uh, do you see what that has to do with concentration? Yes. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. And that by, by practicing concentration, you are able to identify what's going, in your mind, going on in your mind. You know, when we first start practicing, our minds are, are moving around so much, it's really hard to know what's going on and what's inside and what's outside and what other people have told you about yourself that may not be true. It's hard to know all those things. It's, it's only as you, the more you practice and you become aware of and willing to accept your own mind that you can, ju- you can even judge what's going on. <laughs> but I mean judge it more honestly. Ready? Yeah, yeah. That judgment. Yes. Yeah. It's a real trap. I mean, it's a constant trap. It's always set. Ready? (laughs) Need to be stumbled into. Yes. There's of of meditation. One of the it the four the four wheels of meditation. I think it's called. And one of the four is making friends with yourself. So while you're meditating, you're observing what's going on in your mind with a friendly attitude. You're actually making friends with yourself. So that's, that's, how, con- that's how concentration works. Okay. The sixth paramita is called the perfection of wisdom and in Sanskrit it's prajna and in Tibetan it's sherab. Um, So wisdom means clear perception of the phenomenal world and wisdom has Allegiance to prajna, uh, I'm sorry, has allegiance to shunyata, 
Therefore, it's clear and precise. Prajna is a sword that cuts the bondage of ego. Prajna cuts through habitual or potential neurosis. So shunyata, clear perception of the phenomenon, prajna has allegiance to shunyata. And shunyata means emptiness. So that is kind of where, that is what wisdom is, the wisdom of understanding emptiness. But I would say that emptiness is a very difficult concept um, for us as we're learning Buddhism. At least at, at when I first started, I can remember like just reading and going over it again and again and again and not really understanding what it meant. So it's something um, I think that takes some effort to understand. It, well, it's the it's the, what he said about concentration that you hold that object in your mind and you you bring more and more awareness to it until you can actually experience it. So emptiness means, well, any, any ideas about what emptiness means from some of the students who've been around for a while? Ron? <laughs> it's his favorite subject. <laughs> Yeah. It, um, it also means emptiness of concept. So our, our conceptual, in our conceptual minds, we're always projecting things onto ourselves. Ego. We pro we're projecting things. It's like we have a, a, a made-up self. I, I thought about that as I was doing that, um, the judgments of others, like thinking of the judgments of your parents on you, or the judgments of you in your, in your early childhood. Like, it was so difficult for me to be in a classroom. I, I went to Catholic schools where we had to be quiet all day. I mean, that was very painful for me as a, as a young child, as I'm sure it was for everybody. And so it's like there's an, a false ego being imposed right from the very beginning of life for the things that your parents tell you. I mean, we, we have, we're, I mean, and that's, of course, all of our, um, that's why we need our sword. That's why we're warriors, to, to move away from that false ego that's projected on ourselves. So to find emptiness in terms of who we really are. So our our true identity, our true ego, ego means I am. Our true ego comes from our Buddha nature. It's, it's already there inside of us, but we are not connected with it. So this is the path by which we're, we're connected. And prajna, wisdom, is the sword of discrimination, of discriminating between what is good and what is not good, what's virtuous and what is not virtuous, what's going to be helpful and productive in our lives and what's not going to be helpful and productive. So, um, so it has a lot to do. So it's where that idea of a warrior or that idea of battle is, that we're kind of fighting for a more honest identification of who we are. And this is the path that gives us the steps to be able to do that. Mindfulness and awareness comes from the concentration that is developed on the bodhisattva path. And you learn how to be a Mahayana practitioner by being in a state of kindness, compassion, openness, and gentleness. You're also in a state of egolessness, no clinging, no working on or dwelling in anything connected with the ego, Atman, or soul. Uh, wisdom in a virtuous mind that functions mainly, or a wisdom is a virtuous mind that functions mainly to dispel doubt and confusion 
by understanding its object thoroughly. So the, when, what, going back to concentration, what you're trying to, the objects of distraction are doubt and confusion about yourself, your true identity, and the object thoroughly is your own enlightened nature. And perceiving the phenomenal world from that place. Wisdom is a special type of understanding that induces peace of mind by clearly distinguishing what is virtuous and to be practiced from what is non-virtuous and to be avoided. Wisdom provides our spiritual practice with vision. A direct realization of emptiness, the ultimate nature of reality, can be achieved only by a wisdom that is conjoined with tranquil abiding. With, with a wavering mind, we will never perceive a, subject, a subtle object such as emptiness clearly enough to be able to realize it directly. And then uh, through the power of repeated investigations, we will eventually gain a superior knowledge or insight into the nature of our object of meditation. The wisdom of investigation produces suppleness in the mind. By continuing to meditate on emptiness with the wisdom of superior seeing, we can gradually eliminate the generic image until finally we perceive emptiness directly without even a trace of conceptuality. And that um, exact thing is in the Heart Sutra. That which arises interdependently does not cease and does not arise. It is not nothing and not eternal. It does not come and does not go. It's not different and not the same. To the one who teaches peace, the pacification of all projections, to the most sublime of all who speak, to the perfect Buddha, I pay homage. And our contemplation for the projection of wisdom is, the, there's two again. So the first one is work through the greatest defilements first. Any thoughts on that and what that means? Don't try to figure out emptiness before you take <laughs> the path. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, um, defilement, so this has to do with your ego. So when, you know, whenever you, as the judge of yourself, think of as your greatest defilement, work on that. Pick it out and work on it. So if you're lazy or if you're jealous or if you're doubtful or depressed, just take that and work on it. Remember this discriminating awareness, what you're gonna, what you're gonna practice and what, we, what you're gonna cut away from yourself. And then the other, the other one you could meditate on is give up any possibilities of fruition. that you're never gonna to come to one place. That's, here I am in my final place. It's, it's, there's always that path quality of, of, the, of moving on, the next step. All right, we have three minutes to meditate this time. <laughs> 